Okay, so do you have any questions before we start? Now, if you remember last week, we had started uh, looking at identical particles, how we can describe identical particles in a quantum mechanical context. And essentially, uh, what we had concluded was to determine this, if we are looking at non-interacting uh, particles, let's say for simplicity, it, will, it was enough to specify uh, just the numbers, ni. Ni being the number of particles in the state i, in the state, let's say, uh, psi i. Now, uh, just a word of caution, there are several uh, terms, that terminologies that we will be using, which sometimes gets confusing. You see, uh, that is the, in your book, this is the notation that your book uses to determine, to specify the sum over states, but rather this is sum over the energies. And then I will use this summation, this is the sum over states. And each one of these sums can also mean two different things. Let's say sum over x can mean sum over x of individual particles you see sum over in uh, single particle states or sum over the energies of uh, single particles or they can also mean sum of x of the whole system we are we will be basically going back and forth so if you remember in statistics when we were defining the partition function of a system we are sum over, summing over all the uh, microstates of the whole system but the microstate of the whole system a given microstate of the whole system can be written as the product of microstates of single particle uh, systems and the energy of the whole system can also be uh, expressed as the sum over the energies of single particle energies Again, in the limit that we ignore the pot any potential energy between uh, particles, or in the limit that we ignore the potential energy. So I will be, uh, I will try to be specific about what kind of sum or product I will be talking <coughs> about, whether it's a sum over single particle properties or over the whole system. But if if it gets confusing, just let me know. Now, let's. First, we will consider a system of indistinguishable non-interacting particles. We need to evaluate this sum. No. Uh, let's let's start with the uh, microcanonical ensemble. How we can and we will be today we will be discussing how we can apply various ensembles to such a system, taking into account the fact that they are indistinguishable. Now, in the microcanonical ensemble, if you remember, we first defined omega which depends on the uh, total energy of the system, the total number of particles of the system, the total volume of the system. This is the number of microstates of the whole system. That have energy E. number of particles m inside the volume v. Now this number, if you like, we can just write it as sum over 1, sum over the microstates of the system,
consistent with these constraints. So each microstate will contribute one. So when I sum them, sum one over all these microstates, I will get the number of microstates that are consistent with the, those conditions. And once we obtain that omega, we can uh, write the entropy is k times the logarithm of omega, and all the remaining thermodynamics follows. So the crucial thing will be the calculation of this omega. Now the microstates, as we stated before, are specified by these numbers n i. So omega, we can say that this is sum of one of all possible n i's such that the sum of n i is fixed, and the sum of you see, n i is the number of the particles that are in the state, uh, single particle state psi i. It has an energy epsilon i, so n i epsilon i, this should be equal to e. So we are looking at such a uh, constrained sum, which kind of makes uh, our life a bit complicated. Now we will uh, convert this problem to a slightly different one. You see, we, are, we will be eventually uh, looking at uh, microscopic systems. In the thermodynamic limit, the, our systems are infinitely large. If you have infinitely large systems, then the uh, spacing between the energy levels will be infinitely small. So we basically have many states and they are almost continuum. So we will first divide these states into various so-called cells. That's what how your book calls it. So this is one cell, this is a second cell, this is a third cell, etc. In each one of these cells, let's say here there are G0 states, here there are G1 states, here there are G2 states. And these uh, <coughs> Okay, these uh, cells, we can choose them very small, so that the, all, the, all the states within a cell, they have the same energy, more or less. So all the states over here has energy epsilon zero, all the cells over here have energy epsilon one, all the cells over here have energy epsilon two, etc. <coughs> and let's say, uh, here there, are, there might be n0 particles, here there, in this cell there might be n1 particles, in this cell there are n2 particles. So we will first define, let's say, omega ni. This is the number of <coughs> microstates <coughs> corresponding to the numbers and I. Now one advantage of this separation will be that, for example, if you look at the cell G2, if you just shuffle the particles in uh, between the states in G2, you already satisfy one of your constraints. You don't change the total energy of the system. So when you are counting the number of states, you can easily just count how many microstates you obtain by just shuffling the particles within a cell. That will be kind of our uh, advantage. Now with this definition, omega is nothing but omega and i. Let me put a prime over there. The prime just means that I have to satisfy my constraints. Still, sum over n i should be large, and sum over n i epsilon i should be e. Here, in these constraints, now I'm not summing over the microstates, but rather I'm summing over each cells, energy cells. <coughs> now, uh, the next thing: what is omega n i?
Well, you see, we had said that, okay, I first divide my system into cells. When I specify an I, I know how many particles are within each cell. So the number of particles within each cell is fixed. But still, I can shuffle those parts. There are many states in each cell. So the particles that are in a cell can be in various different states. So each cell has many uh, microstates consistent with the given number. And the total number of states that each one of these cells can be in, let us denote that by omega ni, and then just summed over all cells. Where omega, or let's say omega i and i. Omega i and i is the number of microstates that the ith cell can be in with and I particles. So if I have main, let's say five systems, or let's say two systems, if system one can be in five different microstates, system two can be in ten different <coughs> microstates, then the combined system can be in fifty different microstates, just the product of the two. So that's basically what I'm doing over here. I divided my possible microstates, single particle microstates into cells, and then given the number of particles in each cell, each one of these cells can be in various different microstates. So the whole system for a given uh, set Ni, the number of microstates corresponding to that set of Ni will be just the product of the microstates that each one of the cells can be in. Now, the first thing is, what is this omega i and i then? Let us look at that one. Now, of course, depending on what kind of particles that I have, omega i and i will be different. So, omega, let's start with omega i and i for bosons. So, you see, I have here gi states and the total of Ni particles. So the question is, how can I distribute these Ni particles to GI states? I should be basically writing Ni as sum of some integers. I, I, sh I have GI integers. And these numbers a, j, let's say, can be 0, 1. Well, the maximum will be just ni. It cannot be larger than ni. Well, in fact, this problem we had already solved. You see, just let's imagine this one. I have an i particle. Let me just show them by just small spheres. I have to separate these into GI compartments. Just input GI minus one separators. So any distinct ordering of these particles and separators gives me a possible microstate of my system, of my cell, not my system. Well, how many different orderings can I have? I have Ni plus Gi minus 1 objects. I can order all these objects in this many ways, but just exchanging Ni particles doesn't give me a new microstate. So I don't really care about all these different orderings which differ only by the exchange of Ni particles, 
reordering of Ni particles. I also don't care about all the different orderings exchanged by obtaining, uh, by reordering the GI minus 1 separators. So this is omega i and i for particle satisfying Bose Einstein statistics. Now let's look at omega i and i for Fermi Dirac fermions. Now one thing is omega i and i should be equal to zero if no sorry not zero. Yeah, yeah it's zero if n i is larger than g i. I have g i states in the cell and for fermions I know that there, are, there can be at most one fermion in a given state. So within this cell I can only fit at most GI particles. Not all the GI needs to be occupied so basically if I want to put in some fermions in these GI states if I want to put NI fermions in this GI states I need to pick up and I states out of these GI states. If I can, if I tell you which states occupy a fermion, I am specifying the microstate. So then the question is, how many N I states can you pick from GI states? For Fermi Dirac, this is nothing but this combinatorial factor. So I'm just picking up an I objects from out of GI objects. How many different ways can I do that? And this is equal to GI factorial divided by an I factorial GI minus one factorial. GI minus N factorial. Oh, sorry, GI minus N I factorial. You are right. So this is our omega i uh, for the from uh, from Madeira. Now let's look at Maxwell Boltzmann. This the classical system that we have been studying at the beginning. Well, for the Maxwell-Boltzmann case, each one of these particles, I have Ni particles, can be in GI different states. GI to the power Ni different ways. For Maxwell-Boltzmann, they can be identical, but they are distinguishable from the classical system. <coughs> so this is it. Okay, so we already, we kind of have all the ingredients we want. Now what? Now this is what we have. We are looking for the entropy. Well, the entropy is omega, the logarithm of omega, which is given by this sum. Well, one of the reasons why we separated these into cells is, okay, on one hand, we want the cells to be small, because all the states in my cell should have more or less the same energy. On the other hand, I want the number of states in a given cell to be very large, huge. But in the thermodynamic limit, that's not really a problem. 
because the separation will go to uh, zero, the separation between the states. So within any finite range of energies, there will be infinitely many states in the thermodynamic limit. So that's kind of a... Uh, the numbers and i's over here will also be huge. So ni is huge, gi is huge, so all the numbers appearing in these statistics is huge. Well, we can just use the statistical concepts over here. You see, well, one thing we had done in the first month of the, uh, this course was, when we have such huge numbers, you see, omega ni is just the number of, uh, for a given set ni, the number of microstates I have. It's just like if I take the, omega, the logarithm of omega, it's just uh, similar to some kind of an entropy for a given set ni. But we had seen that that number for one choice of the ni is huge. There's a set ni that maximizes that number. And for that set, that number is huge. For any other set that deviates, that number is relatively negligible. So I can rewrite this sum as the logarithm of omega ni star, where this ni star is the set that maximizes omega and i. You see, essentially those numbers that we are talking about in the thermodynamic limit will be, okay, omega will be for some, uh, will be 10 to the power 20, let's say. But for an i star, it will be 10 to the power 10 to the power 20. So I can just ignore 10 to the power 20 compared to 10 to the power 10 to the power 20. So that's basically what I am doing over here. Now the next task is how do we determine that ni star? Well, we have to maximize. logarithm of capital omega and i, which is sum over all i, logarithm of small omega and i, omega i and i, subject to the constraint sum over n i should be n and sum over n i epsilon i should be e. So what is the max? This, uh, okay, if I maximize this, then I determine n i star. And then, of course, uh, we have a, a maximization problem with constraints. And this we solve using Lagrange multipliers. So we basically need to look at the variation of logarithm of omega i and i minus alpha sum of n i, uh, let's write it minus n, minus beta n i epsilon i minus e. We have to look at this variation and equate this to zero. Now, of course, since n is just a constant, there is no variation. I can just ignore that e is a constant. There is no variation of e. I can also ignore that. So this is what I need to determine, sum over i variation of logarithm of omega i and i minus alpha the variation of n i minus beta epsilon i the variation of n i 
this should be equal to zero. Well, with Lagrange multipliers, after using Lagrange multipliers, I can just treat all the variations of Ni independently. That's the basic idea of the Lagrange multipliers. So I can just, from here, I can say that the variation of the logarithm of omega i and i <coughs> divided by the variation of ni minus alpha minus beta epsilon i should be equal to zero. This is the equation that will tell me what ni, ni star is. Of course, this is evaluated at ni is equal to ni star. Now let's, let us look at the various cases we have. We had the uh, Bose-Einstein case, where omega i Bose-Einstein was given by ni plus gi minus 1 factorial divided by ni factorial gi minus 1 factorial. Logarithm of omega i would be the logarithm of ni plus gi minus 1 factorial over ni factorial gi minus 1 factorial. Well, I will also use the Stirling's approximation of the factorial of the logarithm because keep in mind that uh, I'm assuming that I will be going to the thermodynamic limit in which ni, the number of particles in each cell, will be divergent, will go to infinity. The number of states in each cell will uh, go to infinity, so all these numbers are will be in the thermodynamic limit at least, those numbers will be huge. So Stirling's approximation is a good approximation. So this will be equal to ni plus gi minus 1, logarithm of ni plus gi minus 1, minus ni plus gi minus 1, minus ni logarithm of ni plus ni minus ni no, gi yeah. gi minus 1 logarithm of gi minus 1 plus gi minus 1. Well, this, these will cancel each other. I can just ignore this one. As I said, gi is a huge number. So is ni. So this will be equal to ni logarithm of gi over ni plus 1 minus or plus gi 1 plus ni over gi. Okay, so we, we just need to take its derivative with respect to ni. Here, this is the logarithm. This is equal to, well, logarithm of gi over ni plus 1. This is the derivative of ni times the logarithm plus ni times the derivative of the logarithm, which will be minus gi over ni squared divided by gi over ni plus 1 plus gi, 1 over gi, divided by 1 plus ni over gi. Well, let's see, this will cancel one of these, this cancels this one. This is logarithm of gi over ni plus 1. Let's see, plus minus ni Well, let me just move this ni to the numerator, so this is gi over gi plus ni. Here this one is plus gi over 
ki plus ni. So these just cancel. And finally, the variation of the log logarithm of omega i with respect to ni is just logarithm of gi over ni plus 1. Okay, did I do any mistake anywhere? Okay, no. So let's go back. So this was our equation. <coughs> Logarithm of gi over ni star plus 1. This is equal to alpha plus beta epsilon i. gi over ni star is uh, e to the power exponential of alpha plus beta epsilon i plus minus 1. Or ni star over gi. This is 1 over exponential of alpha plus beta epsilon i minus 1. But note that this is nothing but the Bose-Einstein distribution. You see, and I had uh, ni particles in gi states. So ni over gi is nothing but the number of particles per state with an energy epsilon i. So this ratio is just the number of particles in a state with an energy epsilon i. Now this is the most probable number. But the most probable number in a, certain, in a statistical <coughs> system is also the average number because the deviations will be negligible. Of course, this beta is 1 over kt and alpha is minus mu over kt. The Lagrange multiplier. We have to identify it with the chemical potential and the temperature. Well, let's look at the same thing for the Fermi Dirac fermions. Omega i and i, if you remember, the, these were just g i factorial divided by uh, n i factorial g i minus n i factorial. Logarithm of omega i and i using the Stirling's approximation would be g i logarithm of g i minus g i minus n i logarithm of n i plus n i minus g i minus n i logarithm of <coughs> g i minus n i plus g i minus n i. Again, these will just cancel each other. This is equal to g i, well, let's see. Uh, minus gi logarithm of 1 minus ni over gi plus ni logarithm of gi over ni minus 1. Well, again, let's just take the derivative with respect to ni. This is minus gi, well the first term is minus 1 over gi divided by 1 minus ni over gi. From the second term we have plus logarithm of gi over ni minus 1. And then plus ni times minus gi over ni squared divided by 
gi over ni minus 1. And again, this ni will cancel this one. This term will basically cancel this one. So the derivative is just logarithm of gi over ni minus 1. Again, if you go back to our, oops, sorry. This is the defining equation for an i star. And this tells me that the logarithm of gi over an i star minus 1, this should be equal to alpha plus beta epsilon i. gi over an i star, this is equal to exponential of alpha plus beta epsilon i plus 1. And n i star over g i is 1 over e to the power alpha plus beta epsilon i plus 1. <coughs> and again, we see identification beta is equal to 1 over kt. Alpha is equal to minus mu over kt. This is not, nothing but the Fermi Dirac distribution. Again, keep in mind that alpha and beta, they need to be determined by our constraints. Sum over ni star should be n, and sum over ni star epsilon i, this should be equal to e or in terms of these alphas and betas, these are sum over <coughs> gi over e to the power alpha plus beta epsilon i uh, plus a should be equal to n, and sum over i gi epsilon i divided by e to the power alpha plus beta epsilon i plus a, this should be equal to e, and a is 1 for fermions minus 1 for bosons. And the, you just solve these two, try to solve at least these two equations for alpha and beta, and then you know the temperature and the uh, chemical potential in terms of the number of particles there in the system, energy in my system, and the volume of my system. The volume enters into these definitions through the values of epsilon i. Again, keep in mind that this, in these sums, these are sums over the cells. Well, I can convert them to sum over single particle states. Sum over all single particle states. Of 1 over e to the power alpha plus beta epsilon i plus a is equal to n and epsilon i e to the power alpha plus beta epsilon i plus a, this is equal to e. Again, this is also a sum over single particle states. Because you see, when I was defining my cells, I said that, okay, the cells are small enough such that all the states within a cell, they have more or less the same energy. Furthermore, there are GI states. So in the, in the last sum, sums over single particle states, I can still imagine dividing that uh, sum over single particle states to uh, sum over cells and sum over the states of the each cell. But some of, the, uh, some of the single particle states with a given cell, each one of those states contribute the same amount, because they all have the same energy epsilon i, so they just contribute the overall factor g i. So this, la this line 
written in terms of sum over single particle states is the same thing as this line, which is a sum over the uh, cells, energy cells in my system that I used to obtain the result. Well, let's go back to Maxwell Boltzmann. That's something we skipped. Well, we need omega in I. Well, for each cell, we have this many states, microstates of each cell. This is some, the product over cells. And then keep in mind that these are distinguishable particles. So I have n factorial divided by n1 factorial, n2 factorial, etc. Exchanging uh, within a cell doesn't give me a new state. After a Gibbs correction, this just becomes, remember, the Gibbs correction is just divided by n factorial. But now this is the product over i of gi to the ni divided by ni factorial. Omega, keep in mind that this is the sum of omega of ni. Now let's, uh, no. We are looking for the maximum. So logarithm of omega and i. This is sum over i logarithm of g i to the power n i divided by n i factorial. This is sum over i n i times logarithm of g i minus n i logarithm of n i plus n i or this is it well let's just keep it that way the variation of the logarithm of omega minus alpha sum over n i minus beta sum over n i epsilon i would give me well basically i will do the uh, what I did, we did before, the derivative with respect to ni of ni logarithm of gi minus ni logarithm of ni plus ni minus alpha ni minus beta, no, not ni. Minus beta epsilon i should be zero. Well, if I take that derivative logarithm of gi, minus uh, n i derivative of the logarithm is over n i minus logarithm of n i plus one minus alpha minus beta epsilon i should be zero. Well, this cancels this one. Logarithm of n i over g i should be equal to minus alpha minus beta epsilon i or ni star over gi. This will should be equal to exponential of minus alpha minus beta epsilon i. But in all the cases, we actually have ni star over gi. This should be equal to one over e to the power alpha plus beta epsilon i plus a, even in the Maxwell-Boltzmann case. So A is equal to 1 for the Fermi Dirac, minus 1 for Bose Einstein, and 0 for Maxwell Boltzmann. Now, this is 
in the micro canonical ensemble. Then the next end question is on this one. I think it's kind of complicated because we are looking for counting the number of states the, uh, subject to, the con uh, to our constraints and also taking into account the indistinguishable nature of my particles. You see, compared to the previous case, when we were looking at, let's say, the ideal gas, we said that, okay, the uh, sum over states, microstates, of e to power minus beta ei, e, this was equal to in the canonical ensemble like this. This was, or no, let's just erase all this. Yes. Omega was proportional to the phase space volume. constraints. But you see, even in this sum, even if we would stick with this classical description, it might be possible that some particles have the same p and q values. They can be at the same point with the same momentum. Okay, it, it can be that all the particles have this for different p and, p, and, p and q's. So just exchanging those particles shouldn't give me a new state. But this sum takes all that into account, so the correction will be 1 over n factorial. There are n factorial different ways that I can just put my particles in different states. Assuming that all my particles are different at different points at different momenta, or at different momenta, let's say. But it might be that some of them are, have this, are at the same point and at the same momenta. Now, exchanging those two doesn't really give me a new state, even in the classical sense. So this n factorial is kind of uh, over uh, simplified. If there are such cases, it might be that only two particles are in the same state. It might be that two pairs are in the same state. It might be that three particles are in the same state, etc. So we have to take all that into account. Now this discussion over here kind of avoids that discussion by using the trick of dividing my system into cells. First dividing it into uh, cells whose, num the, whose numbers, both the number of states and the number of particles, are <coughs> huge. So that we can use the statistics, so that we can just convert this sum with the prime to this one. So that was the greatest simplification and this derivation. The rest is kind of straightforward. Then, of course, now we need to do the same thing with the canonical and the grand canonical ensemble. Questions? <coughs> Why did we calculate everything for an I star? Well, you see, basically, if you know an I star, you know everything. You say, what would you like to calculate? Now, let's look at S. This is our S. Do we follow why we can express S in terms of Ni star only? It's just replacement of the sum with the term with the term that is the largest in the sum. And this was equal to Yeah, it was an approximation. Huh? It is just an approximation. Well, it's an approximation that works yeah. to a huge accuracy in the thermodynamic limit. 
You see, almost all the uh, results that we obtain are valid, are exact in the thermodynamic limit. For a realistic system, we are not in the thermodynamic limit. But nevertheless, the uh, variations, the errors that we introduce will be proportional to 1 over n or 1 over the square root of n in the worst case. But as long as the number of particles is huge, as long as it's let's say 10 to the power 20, well, the error is one part in 10 to the power 10, typically. So we can just ignore that error. But if you try to apply this for systems, for let's say uh, mesoscopic systems, where you have of the order of 100 particles, well, the errors can be sizable. So that's something you have to keep in mind. Well, this is equal to sum over i, logarithm of small omega i and i, which we can write, okay, let me just uh, take from here. This is approximately equal to sum over i n i star logarithm of g i over n i star minus a minus g i over a logarithm of 1 minus a n i star over g i. Now this, this expression takes into account all cases whether it's uh, Fermi Dirac, Maxwell Boltzmann, or Bose Einstein. Again, keep in mind that A has the values 1 for Fermi Dirac, minus 1 for Bose Einstein, and 0 for Maxwell Boltzmann. And the sec in the second term, there seems to be a, a singularity when A goes to 0, but keep in mind that just treat it as a limit. The limit is finite as A goes to 0. Well, let's see, what are these numbers? Okay, first thing is, okay, the entropy we can write in terms of Ni stars. So once we know Ni stars, we know, every, we know the entropy. Once we know the entropy, we know everything about the system. Now, let's uh, try to simplify this a bit. Sum over I. Ni star, if you keep in mind, if you remember, Ni star was, uh, let me see, Gi times exponential so you see from here an i star is g i times g i over e to power alpha plus beta epsilon i plus a this is our Ni star. <coughs> Times the logarithm of, well, Gi over Ni star is just e to the power alpha plus beta epsilon i plus a minus a. This is Gi over Ni star. minus g i over a logarithm of 1 minus a and i star over g i star is 1 over e to the power alpha plus beta epsilon i plus a. Now let me keep this number as n i star. It will be easier. Well, you see, this a's, they just cancel. So s over k is just sum over i, n i star. If I cancel the a's, what remains is alpha plus beta epsilon i, the logarithm of that number, minus g i over a, logarithm of, let's see, each power alpha plus beta epsilon i divided by e to the power alpha plus beta epsilon i plus a. <coughs> uh, 
This is equal to, well, this alpha is just a constant sum over n i star is just a total number of particles. Again, beta is just a constant. Epsilon i times n i star is just the total energy of my system. Plus, uh, sum over i, g i over a, logarithm of 1 plus a e to power minus alpha minus beta epsilon i. Now, remember, alpha was minus mu over kt. Beta was e over kt, 1 over kt. 1 over a sum over i logarithm of 1 plus a e to power minus alpha minus beta epsilon i. Let me just look at that sum what that sum is. This is equal to st plus mu n minus e divided by kt. Do you remember that ST plus mu and minus E? Now let's look at this one, DE. This was TDS minus PDV plus mu DN. D of E minus TS minus mu N is equal to minus S dt minus p dv minus n d mu. Keep in mind that e minus t s minus mu n. In this expression, it says that I can write it as a function of t, of mu, and of v. Well, e minus t s minus mu n is an extensive property it should scale with the size of my system. But the only argument that depends on the, of that combination that depends on the size of the system is V. So that E minus T S minus mu and that combination has to be proportional to V. And if I take the derivative of that combination with respect to V, what remains should be P. So that tells me that this combination is actually minus PV. P is a function of T and mu and V. So that's sum 1 over A logarithm of 1 plus A e to the power minus alpha minus beta epsilon I should actually be PV over KT. But you see we had already said that PV over KT when we were studying grand canonical ensemble. Well, this was what we had defined as the Q potential. So now we know how to express the Q potentials. Again, keep in mind here the summation over I is a summation over, well, let's see, I, here this is, there is a GI over there. So that summation is a summation over, in this form, summation over the cells. But as I said before, I can easily convert that to a summation over the single particle microstates.
Now again, the reasoning is exactly the same. I can just divide that single particle state into cells, and I can just divide that sum into sums over cells and the sum within a cell. And so sum within a cell, since all the states within a cell have the same energy, they just give an overall constant, which we define as GI. So we know the Q potential of the system. Well, we already said that we can calculate the entropy of my system, but now we also have the Q potential of the system. So knowing the entropy or the Q potential, we know everything. Again, I repeat, beta is 1 over kT. Alpha is minus mu over kT. Okay, so let's give a break here. Then after the break, we can discuss what happens in the canonical and in the grand canonical ensemble.